Well, thank you, Lisa. That's a very kind introduction. Uh, I'm not sure, I, I guess my, my words are being um, amplified. So um, yeah, it's a great honor to uh, be here, to be part of the uh, TAILS project. This is a really exciting initiative. And um, I'm really um, grateful for the opportunity to talk a little bit about how I approach some teaching issues. Um, and uh, as I um, have outlined up here, the, the main challenge um, that I'm setting out for today is uh, helping students grasp simultaneously uh, the substantive content of social and political issues uh, that is to say, uh, having them make sure they understand the rational dimensions of those issues, uh, the merits of the various arguments for and against certain propositions, how and why decision makers uh, make the choices that they make, but at the same time, also um, getting some understanding of the, of the uh, subjective experience of people who are caught up in those issues, the, uh, the emotional investments that people have in those issues, the uh, extra rational or psychological motivations that push them in certain directions. Um, and this maps on to a more general concern I have as a, uh, as a teacher, uh, especially a teacher of uh, modern U.S. history with a particular focus on uh, the history of U.S. foreign relations, and that's to uh, try to convey some sense of uh, top-down decision-making and bottom-up activity and perception, um, to help people understand how and why uh, political leaders make certain decisions, and how and why uh, people who are more broadly diffused throughout society, whether they're activists, consumers of popular culture, makers of popular culture, ordinary citizens, how they um, interact with the decision making of people uh, at the uh, top of the um, political system. Um, and what I should say also is that in each of these realms, you know, high politics, and broader um, societal uh, experience, uh, what I'm trying to do is to explore um, both of these dimensions, the uh, substantive, rational um, element to decision making and, and politics, and the subjective, more emotionally charged um, dimension as well. Um, and only by looking at both of those realms, uh, seeing in both uh, of those registers, can we fully understand how these political processes unfold? In other words, what we need to do is both see from the outside and feel from the inside. Now, um, I'm going to be exploring these issues today by looking at the Vietnam War and the anti-war movement. And as the, what I just said suggested we'll be looking both at the decision making at the top of the US government, in particular uh, decisions by Lyndon Johnson, President of the United States uh, in the 1960s, and at uh, anti-war activists and how they responded to and pushed back against decisions that uh, Lyndon Johnson made. Um, now as I do this, what I'm basically going to um, give you is a truncated version of a, a much longer lecture that I deliver in uh, undergraduate courses. Even so, it will probably be a little bit more front-loaded with information than your typical tales presentation. Um, and I, I made that choice because I think it's essential to convey a certain um, volume of information in order for this exercise that we will do toward the end of my talk to work, which is a simulated debate on the merits of um, some issues related to the Vietnam War and the protest against it. And in order to, for that to work, there needs to be a certain um, um, level of information conveyed to you. So that, that's um, what you um, can expect. Um, one, one more thing I want to say is that what I typically do 
at the start of each course I teach is to issue sort of a blanket trigger warning. Um, a lot of the material that I deal with is very disturbing. There, you know, there's lots of violence, there's lots of crude language, uh, of ugly uh, kinds of thinking being expressed. And so I, I let students know from the beginning that from time to time they're going to witness and experience some of that, both in the words that they hear from me and uh, in the images that they see on the screen. So um, there's not a whole lot of very disturbing imagery in my presentation, but there is some. So you um, can, can consider yourself uh, trigger warned. OK, so what I'm going to do now is just, as I said, give you um, a truncated version of the uh, a Vietnam lecture I, I give in a, a couple of different courses I teach, but I will from time to time um, step outside of my direct teaching role and talk a little bit about what in fact I'm doing. This is the sort of the meta dimension as uh, Lisa likes to say. Um, so we'll start by uh, giving a little bit of background on the uh, Vietnam War. Uh, since the end of World War II, uh, first France and then the United States waged a futile struggle against an indigenous liberation movement in Vietnam known as the Viet Minh under the leadership of Ho Chi Minh. Um, the fact that the Viet Minh were both nationalists and communists um, had crucial consequences for the unfolding of that struggle. Because the Viet Minh were nationalists, uh, they had broad and committed support uh, throughout Vietnam, making them extremely difficult to defeat. Because they were communists, it was virtually impossible for the US government, for both domestic, political, and ideological reasons, to allow them to prevail, or at least to accept that they might prevail. So the result was a disastrous war lasting nearly 30 years. Uh, in 1954, the major powers of the world met in Geneva and agreed that Vietnam should be temporarily divided at the 17th parallel, uh, with the Viet Minh controlling the north uh, and a pro-US government controlling the south. According to the Geneva Agreement, within two years, elections were to be held throughout Vietnam, and the country was to be reunited under the leadership of the party that won those elections. Um, but the Eisenhower administration, that's the, the presidency uh, at the time, uh, feared that if the elections were held, the Viet Minh would emerge victorious and then move Vietnam into the communist camp. Uh, so the administration ignored the call for national elections and built up South Vietnam as if it were a separate nation. In 1960, a guerrilla movement in South Vietnam called the National Liberation Front, also known as the Viet Cong, began fighting against the US-supported South Vietnamese government. Uh, the Viet Cong wanted to overthrow the southern government and reunite the South with the North. And the North Vietnamese strongly supported the Viet Cong, first by sending them arms and supplies, and later by sending their own troops into the South to fight alongside the Viet Cong. So the Eisenhower administration um, and then the Kennedy administration uh, stepped up a policy that they had already begun, which was to provide um, weapons and training to the South Vietnamese government and army so that they could combat the uh, Viet Cong. By the time Kennedy was assassinated in 1963, um, 16,000 American troops were in South Vietnam, uh, officially playing only advisory roles. They were not supposed to be in combat. So this was the situation that um, Kennedy's successor, Lyndon Johnson, inherited uh, when he became president um, following Kennedy's assassination in November 1963. Now, at this point in the lecture, I provide some more background on Lyndon Johnson's background and perspective to give some sense of his own uh, subjective approach to um, the, the challenge that he faced in Vietnam. 
But the, the main point that I want to convey is that Johnson really didn't want to get sucked into a land war in Asia. He wanted to devote himself to America's domestic needs, uh, to defeat poverty, to end racial discrimination, to provide greater security to the nation's elderly. Uh, as a young congressman in the 1930s, uh, Johnson had idolized President Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, and now that he was president himself, he wanted to go down in history as the leader who would finally complete FDR's unfinished work. Uh, and indeed, in the first couple years of his presidency, Johnson racked up an extremely uh, impressive record of domestic achievements. No time to go into it now, but basically in the area of civil rights, uh, the provision of um, security to the elderly and the, um, and the impoverished, um, a, uh, a so-called war on poverty. Um, these were all uh, major achievements of his, and they all fell into the rubric of uh, the Great Society, uh, which, was, which really was the initiative to which he wanted to devote his presidency, not to some foreign adventure in Vietnam. Yet, Johnson faced a number of dilemmas that ultimately drew him into that foreign adventure and also determined the manner in which he navigated that adventure. Um, in the first place, Johnson feared that if South Vietnam fell to communism on his watch, there would be a ferocious right-wing backlash within the United States, a backlash so powerful as to make it impossible for him to achieve his uh, ambitious domestic goals. Johnson could not forget um, the, uh, how the fall of China to communism um, in 1949 had severely weakened the Truman administration and had uh, allowed Republicans to accuse the Democrats of losing China and of being soft on communism. And indeed, it was in the aftermath of the fall of China to communism that the most virulent phase of the post-World War II Red Scare occurred when Senator Joseph McCarthy uh, ran rampant through the land. So Johnson was determined not to have this happen um, to him. Um, if the first dilemma touched on the dangers of doing too little in Vietnam, the second dilemma stressed the perils of doing too much. Here, Johnson worried that if he escalated the Vietnam War too blatantly, conservatives in Congress would be able to argue that the country was now facing an international emergency and could no longer afford to keep funding the Great Society. Uh, such an escalation could also provoke communist China to intervene in the conflict, as it had done uh, a decade and a half earlier in Korea after the United States carelessly uh, escalated that conflict. So there were dangers in doing too little and dangers in doing too much. And consequently, consequently Johnson tried to follow a middle course in Vietnam doing just enough to keep the South Vietnamese government afloat, but not so much that the conflict became a major war, which would not only be dangerous in its own right, but divert money and attention away from his cherished great society. Now, Johnson's objective was not uh, ever to defeat North Vietnam, only to convince the North Vietnamese and their allies in the South the Viet Cong to abandon their goal of unifying all of Vietnam under communist control. Um, you see what I'm doing here is I'm taking us into Johnson's mind, right? So the, the, the visuals are, are reinforcing that. Um, but the problem with the strategy, and this was something that Johnson realized from the start, was that even taking the minimum action necessary to keep the South Vietnamese government afloat um, would likely involve increased American involvement. And this was because the South Vietnamese government was so uh, incompetent and corrupt and really not capable of hacking it on its own. So as early as the spring of 1964, 
Johnson knew that he would probably have to send ground troops to South Vietnam. Still, he hoped to do it in a gradual way that did not create the appearance of a major war and thus give conservatives in Congress the excuse to cut back on great society programs. Um, yet Johnson realized that even this middle course was fraught with peril, and he wanted Congress to share responsibility for it. That way, if things fell apart, he wouldn't be the only one left holding the bag. And this is a point I always make to my students. If you want to understand how national policy is made, especially foreign policy, a big element is the desire to avoid being blamed for disaster, because things really often go badly. And a key ob uh, objective of any national leader is to avoid being solely blamed for something. So Johnson, he sees there's possible disaster coming, and he doesn't want to be the only one uh, responsible for it. So in the spring of 1964, his administration drew up a request for a congressional resolution authorizing the president to take whatever action he sought fit to defend South Vietnam. Uh, resolutions of this sort are uh, sometimes called blank check resolutions, since they authorize the president in advance to take future actions that he himself uh, gets to specify. Uh, so Johnson had a request for a blank check resolution all set to go, uh, but he hesitated to submit the request to Congress because he feared he did not have sufficient support in the Senate. Um, so he held the reservation in reserve, the resolution in reserve. But then, in the summer of 1964, a naval incident occurred off the coast of North Vietnam that gave him just the opportunity he needed. Now, at this point, I'm making an executive decision as I'm watching the clock, which is not to show the piece of video that I had prepared. And so I will instead uh, walk you through it. Um, uh, there will be some later video that I will show. Um, essentially, what happened is that in um, August 1964, there were a series of murky incidents off the coast of North Vietnam in the Gulf of Tonkin that um, the Johnson administration portrayed as acts of aggression against the US Navy. But even at the time that these events were occurring, the, there was considerable uncertainty about what was actually occurring, and there really was not, inside the Johnson administration, a strong um, uh, belief that North Vietnam had actually attacked the United States. Nonetheless, because Johnson wanted to get his resolution passed, he portrayed this, uh, these events to the nation as acts of um, unprovoked aggression by North Vietnam and got Congress to pass a resolution, the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, authorizing him to take whatever measures he saw fit to uh, protect the sovereignty and security of South Vietnam. Um, it, now, it was only a few years before the very shaky basis on which the Johnson administration received this resolution became widely accepted. And in 1970, um, the House and Senate both repealed the, uh, the, the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. Um, and uh, not for the last time, critics would accuse the President of the United States of having lied the nation into war. And this is something I do spend some time on uh, with my students so that they really understand um, the, how this widespread view that the Johnson administration misled the country to get into war took hold. Because it, it, that perception plays a key role in the manner in which the anti-war movement itself uh, unfolded. OK. Um, now. Um, but back to 1964, um, which was an election year. And Johnson was running for a presidential term in his own right. Even with the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, he hoped to be seen as the peace candidate, as the candidate who would not escalate the Vietnam War. 
Um, and his task was made infinitely easier by the fact that his Republican opponent was Senator Barry Goldwater of Arizona, a far right-wing hawk who insisted that the United States should escalate the Vietnam War um, by actually invading North Vietnam. Uh, and Goldwater's hawkishness was not confined to Vietnam. He complained that Americans had an inordinate fear of the atom bomb. And he liked to joke about lobbing one into the men's room of the Kremlin. Uh, when people accused Goldwater of being an extremist, he, famous, uh, he um, openly embraced the label, declaring at one point, extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. The um, slogan for Goldwater's campaign was, in your heart, you know he's right. <laughs> the Democrats had their own version of that. <laughs> and here's an illustration of how not everything needs to be spoken aloud. Um, and compared to Goldwater, Lyndon Johnson really did seem to be the peace candidate. In, and in uh, November 1964, he was elected by a landslide. Ironically, no sooner had Johnson won the election than he began escalating the Vietnam War in a manner not too different from Goldwater's program. As I said, Johnson had known since the spring of 1964 that he would have to escalate the war, but he dared not make any moves in this direction um, until after he had been safely elected in 1964. Uh, it was understood throughout Johnson's inner circle that as soon as the election was over, some pretext would have to be found for increasing US involvement in Vietnam probably by sending more US troops to the South. Um, and the uh, Viet Cong were not shy about handing Johnson such a pretext. In late 1964 and early 1965, they staged a series of highly effective attacks on the South Vietnamese army and on American air bases. It was the first time the Viet Cong had directly attacked uh, US targets directly uh, themselves. Johnson responded in two ways. Uh, first, he launched a major aerial bombing campaign against North Vietnam. Uh, second, he began quietly, without fanfare, increasing the number of troops stationed in South Vietnam. By April 1965, 72,000 American soldiers were in Vietnam. And in July, the commander of the US forces in South Vietnam, General William Westmoreland, asked Johnson for another troop increase, bringing the numbers up to 125,000 men immediately and to 200,000 by the end of the year. And in what would turn out to be the most fateful decision of his presidency, Johnson granted Westmoreland's request. The influx of so many American troops into South Vietnam fundamentally transformed the conflict, such that the United States now bore the major responsibility for waging the war. Now, it should be stressed again that Johnson's aim was not to conquer North Vietnam. Rather, it was to compel the North to stop supporting the Viet Cong and to respect South Vietnam's sovereignty. Uh, but from the North's perspective and that of the Viet Cong, South Vietnam was not a separate nation entitled to sovereignty. It was a province of Vietnam illegally occupied by a foreign power. And indeed, the Geneva Agreement of 1954 had explicitly stated that the 17th parallel was not an international boundary. It was a temporary demarcation line that should be eradicated um, very soon. So the United States was on very shaky legal ground when it accused North Vietnam of committing aggression against a, South, uh, a sovereign nation. Another problem was that although Johnson's approach was a middle way of sorts, it was hardly free from brutality. The Americans refrained from invading the North, but they sure bombed the hell out of it. They also conducted major bombing campaigns throughout the South. Uh, by early 1968, 
they had dropped more tonnage on Vietnam as a whole than on all fronts during World War II. And many of these bombs were dropped by planes flying at very high altitudes uh, that were not capable of targeting um, with precision. And so uh, indiscriminate bombing raids on densely populated areas resulted inevitably in heavy civilian casualties. Uh, in the South, the United States pursued a strategy that was extremely destructive to the basic fabric of village life. Uh, the main objective of the American military was to destroy the Viet Cong's ability to wage war against the regime. And one way to do that was to go out and kill as many Viet Cong as possible. But another was to um, destroy the infrastructure on which the Viet Cong relied. Um, when the US military discovered that a particular village was harboring the Viet Cong or being used as a staging area for their attacks, a frequent response uh, was to evacuate the village and set fire to all of the houses. As you might imagine, this did little to endear ordinary Vietnamese to the United States. Um, so the US involvement in Vietnam escalates very rapidly over the next three years, so that by 1968, you have 538,000 troops in Vietnam. Nonetheless, no matter how much firepower and how many troops the United States devoted to the struggle, uh, it could not defeat the will of either the Viet Cong or the North Vietnamese to unite the whole country under communist control. Uh, and here is where I segue to talk about the uh, anti-war movement. And uh, we'll set ourselves up for a, a, an exercise that we will do in just a, a few minutes. Um, domestic opposition to Johnson's Vietnam policy grew very rapidly after 1965. Um, the first um, opponents were uh, young radicals, in many cases veterans of the civil rights movement who uh, conducted teach-ins at universities like the University of Michigan and UC Berkeley um, to raise awareness um, of the war. Now, the initial response to their um, critique was, uh, was very hostile on the part of the US government and the national media. Um, but uh, within just a year or so, you start seeing um, other figures in mainstream American society um, opposing the war, albeit on the basis of different arguments. So you have, among establishment critics, you have hawks, or conservatives who are uh, upset with Lyndon Johnson's middle course. They think he should act much more vigorously um, against the North Vietnamese, perhaps by actually invading the North with ground troops. And principal figures um, taking this point of view are uh, Barry Goldwater, whom we just met, and a rising star in California politics, Ronald Reagan, who was elected governor in 1966. And there are also uh, doves. These are basically liberals uh, in Congress and in some cases represented in the national media. They think the goal of uh, preserving South Vietnam is a noble one, but they don't think that it can be accomplished at an acceptable cost. And so they are urging Johnson to pull out. Now, um, the radical element of the anti-war movement, and these are people who see the Vietnam War as basically rotten through and through. They don't think the goal is worthy, and they certainly don't see the means by which it is being pursued um, as, as worthy. And um, they, by 1967, are becoming increasingly militant. Um, in their opposition, um, as exemplified by this protest at the um, Pentagon in October 1967, where 200,000 protesters um, surrounded the Pentagon um, while some of them clashed with the police. Um, and by this time, President Johnson could not appear on university campuses without being heckled and jeered. A common chant of the day was, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? Uh, another was, ho, ho, Ho Chi Minh, 
NLF, that's the Viet Cong, uh, is going to win. And also, by late 1967, a fundamental shift in tactics was taking place within the activist anti-war movement, a shift indicated by the slogan, from protest to resistance. Increasingly, anti-war activists uh, were becoming convinced that protest marches, however massive, would not be enough to stop the war. Such marches had been occurring for over two years, and yet Johnson had continued to send troops into Vietnam. And now, in late 1967, there were half a million American soldiers there. If the war was to be ended, the activists concluded, then they would have to take concrete action to resist the war effort, not symbolic or performative ones. So in October 1967, as part of a campaign known as Stop the Draft Week, a group of Bay Area activists decided to blockade the military induction center in Oakland, California, to prevent the government, physically prevent it, from processing young men who had been drafted to fight in Vietnam. So here we'll, we'll do our exercise. What I'm going to do is show you a, uh, an excerpt from a documentary. This is the documentary Berkeley in the 60s, which came out in 1990. And it depicts this effort on the part of radical activists to physically obstruct the operations of the Oakland Induction Center. And when we're done watching it, I want to have a discussion or even a, a debate um, with all of you. So as you're watching, I want you to think about the appropriateness of the kinds of protest tactics you see these activists engaging in. What arguments could you come up with in favor of the very militant tactics that they are um, employing? Um, and what arguments might you come up with to critique what they're doing? Perhaps argue that even if you share their goal of bringing the Vietnam War to an end, nonetheless, the way they're trying to achieve that goal is counterproductive. So let's, let's watch the film, and then we'll have a little discussion. I think we were pretty convinced that we were going to shut down the induction center when we went down there. We felt strong. There were a lot of us. We felt well organized. We had a lot of planning meetings. We didn't want to say, we don't cooperate with the war. We wanted to say, uh-uh, we, we aren't going to allow you to wage the war. We're going to fight you. <laughs> Tuesday morning, the police came in wielding their clubs. And they took us seriously, you know? We said we were going to fight them, so they fought us. And it was a disaster. We just melted. They wiped us out. was here come the buses and there is not a damn thing you can do about it and I began seeing all these young faces in the windows going by me and I just wanted to reach out and and just grab them and stop them and say listen this is your life you're putting on the line here and but what came out was don't go busload after busload after busload of young men that day and they were going off to die and I remember being sort of physically sickened and realizing that I couldn't affect even that part of the war here I was face to face with these young men and yet you know not one of them turned back I don't think we stopped one inductee from making that critical choice of stepping across the line and going to Vietnam, I don't think we made one bit of difference that day. Does the demonstration bother you? No, I think it's kind of funny. All them bums running around doing nothing. 
We go down there twice as strong as we did today. We go down there with twice as many shields as we did today. And we go down there with everybody wearing one of these. If you can see the dents in there, I don't know whether you can see it from here, but that's what stands between me and a cracked skull from the highway patrol of the state of California. Where do you get the hats? Army and Navy surplus. We didn't give up. We didn't say, uh-oh, it didn't work. <laughs> we were able to build um, uh, for another demonstration on Friday. And on Friday, we in fact had our riot, the riot that we had planned. and push them back block after block. And I remember thinking, this is like a metaphor. If enough Americans believed the war were wrong, we could end it. the downtown area of Oakland um, for most of the day. And the cops were outnumbered and confused and scared. And we shut down the induction center. We did just what we said we were going to do. We shut the mother down. I went to the Stop the Draft Week protests. And what I saw there made me convinced that action in the streets of that sort was not going to lead to the kind of change necessary to stop the war. I saw a lot of people from Berkeley tear people's fences down Fences that belonged to people that probably made $5,000 a year were ripped out to block people's cars. Bobby Avakian, son of a judge, a well-known young would-be radical, let the air out of the tires of the federal district attorney. This was going to stop the war. I just thought this was a burlesque of opposition to the war. It's come to this. There's nothing else to do. Uh, the picketing and all of that was just uh, wasn't working. Uh, it's time for confrontation. We did stumble upon a strategy where we said, hey, look it, if you continue that war in Vietnam, uh, there's going to be chaos here in the streets of the United States. We could say, hey, every place you try to do anything that happens to do with the war, there's going to be thousands and thousands of young people rioting, trying to stop you from doing it. While it was a great success and a turning point, it was also the first clear demonstration that the, the radical part of the, the anti-Vietnam War movement was coming up against its own limitations. It didn't really have the weight in society to stop the war. And I think that it was after that that the Berkeley radical scene became more and more cut off from reality. And the question of moving American society, changing people, really was getting lost. Okay, so you see the activists themselves differing over the appropriateness of these um, uh, tactics in retrospect. So let me hear from you guys. What's a, who wants to argue in favor of what we saw here? What would be uh, the case that you would make um, that these kinds of uh, actions are, um, uh, were necessary? 
Thank yes. you for this really engaging, making me think a lot of things and ask some questions. Um, so I think what's important is to remember the broader context, and that is that direct action is very, um, isn't just to this particular, but a lot of the, the, the black civil rights, the Chicano movement, they had moved into that phase mm -hmm. of the direct action. Mm -hmm. No longer we're gonna sit back, we're gonna take. So, and I think that that was part of the sort of area in which they were operating, they felt that they had to do that at that point, because that's mm -hmm. what, um, so it's interesting now that I, um, oh, sorry. I don't, um, so I feel that they, um, so it was a moment in which direct action was something that people were doing. Um, but it's interesting to, as I see the video, uh, when I was in grad school, we showed this video to our students and the students were freaked out. <laughs> they couldn't understand what was happening. But, um, because it's a Reagan baby era, 1980s mm -hmm. students. But, um, and so, but looking at what, this, what uh, the, the young men were filing out of the bus, I saw young men of color and I thought like, this is interesting. It reminds me like, who are the protesters? It's predominantly white. Um, I'm not sure if they're all middle class. Some of them, they dodge the draft, that kind of thing. And the young men who are going through was probably poor men, black men, men of color, or others. And so there's a lot of complicated aspects mm -hmm. to it. So, but um, I, th I think it's the era in which they were doing it, direct action, mm -hmm. the militancy. Okay, all right. Um, so yeah, certainly so they, um, this was a, something that was not confined to the Vietnam War, it was taking place more broadly, and so it had a certain kind of legitimacy within um, the movement, as it was called at the time. But who, what other um, arguments would you make in favor of what we saw there? Yeah. Um, if, you, if, the, if you perceive the system of governments to be broken and completely that operating within it is is not an option, then mm -hmm. this is the kind of action you take. So it's a dis, it's a complete intervention or disruption and a rejection of civil society. That it wasn't, and also a kind of sense of urgency because that clearly was what they like. The primary goal was to sort of um, instill that sense of urgency and needing to stop that whatever procedurally was happening was too slow, mm -hmm. was too you know that there needed to be a kind of crisis. And okay. they were, I mean, effective, I think, at least in visually conveying it. I don't, I wasn't alive to know how resonant mm -hmm. that was. So, <laughs> right, so, so the, the notion that peaceful protests had been ineffective, and so if this war was gonna be ended, then more militant and direct forms of action were appropriate. Now, what about uh, arguments against what you saw here, even if you may share the goal of ending the war in, the Viet in Vietnam, uh, how would you critique what we just saw? Yeah. I, mean, I definitely saw a little bit of this, the, the anger displaced, a little, uh, not displaced, uh, misused perhaps, as someone said also. Like, see, I think he described it as burlesque. Mm -hmm. um, and piggybacking off her point, you know, there's definitely an argument to be made, even now we see it and we've seen in the last few years, that protest is a vehicle of people of privilege. You know, like I think about like the Wall Street, like, uh, not Wall Street, um, Occupy. People, Occupy. I mean, you have to have some means to be able to take off work and live in an REI tent mm -hmm. for a couple of weeks while other people are working. At the same token, the other thing here is to, as she said, you know, people who are white, you know, telling people of color don't go, when we also know historically that often people of color were given a choice to go to prison or to go to Vietnam. So take up the resentment with the judicial system. Plus to this date, the, fa the fastest way to become a US citizen is to join the military. Mm -hmm. So if you're gonna get angry at these folks, get angry at the system at large. Mm -hmm. But I, I definitely, yeah. So. Yeah, so the sense that, that the anger is misdirected, um, you're saying uh, directed at the recruits, uh, others, you know, in the video, were pointing out that it was directed against these lower middle class um, uh, residents of the of the neighborhood whose fences were being torn up. Uh, you could also argue going against the police. You know, the, the, many of them are presumably not of a high um, socioeconomic status. Um, any other um, arguments, critiques? Uh, it didn't seem like it was viably sustainable as a means of protest or stopping any. I mean, like so. People have to go home at the end of the day, and then the 
the, the center is just going to open up again the next mm -hmm. day. Like how they, they had no sort of structure, structural kind of sense of how they could actually stop whatever it is they're trying to stop, right? Um, okay, I, I understand what you're saying there. Now, what about this particular, I mean, this um, pushback against what you said, which is that cumulatively, um, this may have had a, made a difference, that it, even if this particular protest um, didn't achieve a whole lot, the fact that m many more like it could. occurred and could be expected to occur may have had some impact on the thinking of uh, political leaders. Sure, on the thinking of political leaders, but I mean, if, if that, was, that wasn't clearly the goal, I mean, maybe that was part of the goal, mm -hmm. but that, that seems a, a rather extreme way to uh, try and impact your politician by ripping up someone's fence and flipping uh -huh. cars and things okay. like that. <laughs> All right, any, any other um, points that people want to make either for or against what we saw? I'll just say that I'm still glad that they did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right, and, that, and that's an argument that kind of, I guess, sort of picking up on the cumulative uh, uh, perspective, which is that uh, these did have an impact over time. Um, now, some might argue that this is not an appropriate form of action to take in a democracy, um, because there are opportunities for citizens to uh, register their uh, opinions, and there were plenty of opportunities for these young people, ex in unless we include those who are too young to vote, but if you were over 21, and I think m many of the figures that we saw here were, they had, op they, they had the vote, they had other ways of registering dissent in, in a democracy. Um, what do you guys think about that argument? I just like in a democracy there's still a minority involved and so mm -hmm. not everyone's voices may be equal there mm -hmm. obviously were or was a group of people that didn't agree with the policies with you know drafting and going into Vietnam so there was still a minority and voting didn't show their voice mm -hmm. and so taking to the streets protesting that was as a result their only way to show their voice and to say that they weren't happy Okay, so I mean, maybe one way of paraphrasing it is that we expect the government not to engage in actions that are just so disturbing that they are completely unacceptable to substantial minorities of the population. That anything the government does should be broadly acceptable even to those who may not agree with every step the government takes. Um, does anyone else want to? I think one thing that's missing from the context that you've presented was the the very uh, common sight in the media and in towns all across the country of people coming home in body bags. There were mm -hmm. funerals and funerals and funerals. And then there was the imagery of, horrible imagery of people being burned with napalm. Um, so. It, the tenor of the time was that what was happening was so extreme that I think we came to believe that what we had to do had to be that extreme to counter it. I regret that now, <laughs> but, but that's... I'm uh, sorry, so what do you regret? <clears throat> I wish that the anti-war movement had chosen to continue the civil rights movement, both in alliance with the civil rights movement, but adopt the tactics that Martin Luther King had pushed. You know, in retrospect, we created this awful backlash that I think is continuing to this day. Um, I think what we did was, uh, all, in the long run, pretty disastrous. <clears throat> I'm having no trouble empathizing. I was inducted. Uh, I was drafted and, and inducted at the Oakland Center. Is that right? Oh, wow. <laughs> and, uh, and then I used, I was, was a student in Berkeley, and I used to have to plan 
my route to campus to get around the tear gas. Um, so anyway, I'm having no trouble empathizing. Wow, <laughs> well, it's, it's, a, it's a real uh, privilege for us to have you with us, to be uh, a direct witness to these events. And you're absolutely right that uh, there needed to be a lot more context of the carnage of the war itself um, in order to fully understand the urgency that the anti-war activists uh, felt about bringing an end to this war. Yes. Um, wasn't the government also lying about how many people were dying? So I think there was this kind of, the idea that you were gonna go into a voting booth and change mm -hmm. things if the government was lying to you. Why would you have any faith in, in politicians or the political system as a whole if they're telling you, you know, only this many people died and there's the coffins that are in the city center are telling you otherwise? Because wasn't that the case? Or there was an election on this issue and Sandy Weber was defeated. Was, with Jean McCarthy, that, that was the Democratic anti war movement and it was, it was yeah. defeated. Well, okay, yeah, a, a number of really key points here. Uh, the first, and, and this I think is a very powerful argument to the democracy um, critique, that these activists had every opportunity to register their opinion. Um, that, that works only if the government is uh, telling you the truth. And this is why I dwelt at some length on the um, Tonkin Gulf Resolution, because the, the, the uh, dishonesty with which the government got the Congress, um, and by extension the broader public, in, committed to the war, um, w you know, was really central to this, and, the, and, and there were subsequent um, instances of government dishonesty. Those were all really central to this belief that much more militant actions were necessary, and that the, the normal democratic processes were, were not going to work. And, um, you're right about the, um, the election. Uh, now this, of course, is prior to the 68 election, but there was a previous election, the 64 election, in which Johnson, is, and that's why I dwelt on that issue too, Johnson basically posed as the peace candidate. He was the one who would not escalate the war, and then that's exactly what he did. So it, it, those, are, those kinds of experiences contribute to this deep sense of betrayal uh, on the part of uh, anti-war activists. Now, uh, do we need to wrap this up? Okay. Oh, sure. Okay. I'll, I'll, I mean, I'll go as long as people wish, but I don't want to keep people if, who need to be elsewhere. Yeah. So if, if people want to break out of the debate format and move more directly into just discussion of the issues or of, of my teaching approach, um, we can do that. Thank you. I wanted to ask another question. From At the beginning of the um, talk, you talked about that you were going to be looking at two issues. Um, well. Uh, that what the main things that you do in the classroom that and one is to provide the substantive context and the other one is to talk about the subjective experiences of people sort of caught up in these issues mm -hmm. so I always have um, so the and I put here my question that was uh, is the substantive context objective then um, you know because I think that I have a hard I teach a, teach a class call about the US Mexico border mm -hmm. immigration I've been teaching it for 15 16 years mm -hmm. and it's a tough class. I sweat every time I teach that and say things because, um, uh, you know, it's a tough, and how you contextualize and present information, and there's choices made and what you say and how you say it, what you choose to look at to some extent. I mean, there's literature, there's, you know, you debate, but how do you approach it? I mean, because I was thinking the way you were framing LBJ, I mean, we could frame him and somebody else might frame him quite differently, but um, I just wonder how you, how, how we do that, how do we, um, you know, I students. I like when students tell me, "Oh, you prevent, present information so objectively." You know, like in my head, I'm thinking, "Like, okay, that's." It. But so, how do you do yeah, that? Yeah. Well, I mean, I understand the um, limitations of objectivity, and um, certainly, you know, shy away from making those kinds of claims. I do think it's something to strive for, and I do believe that there are certain ways of looking at things that get us closer to the truth than others. And um, I, mean, I, and I guess I approach this in a, a, what may seem a kind of methodologically naive way, which is just um, try to acquire as much information as possible from as many different perspectives as possible, and, and then put it into some kind of a narrative 
that um, has, does have coherence and um, intelligibility, but that tries to honor the complexity of the issue and um, the fact that some things can't be known and need to be a matter of speculation. And I mean, I guess that's, that's the best answer I can give in a, in a short you know, form. I mean, one could, I guess, explore it at greater length. And, and probably the best way to do that would be to, to bring out examples and, and talk about them at greater length. But that would be my, my shorthand answer. Yeah. I'm curious to know, um, you know, in working with undergraduates who have maybe no or very little, you know, exposure to mm -hmm. this, um, I certainly did as a freshman in mm -hmm. college, whatever that was, um, you know, how do you um, or do you draw parallels? I mean, now this seems really timely. Any mm -hmm. discussion of the 1960s seems mm -hmm. incredibly timely. Um, do you make parallels for your students here? I know the UC system is still facing the um, gentleman mentioned, like the consequences of um, Berkeley students doing right. That there's discussion that funding and things mm -hmm. is has been affected long term because of the. Pro Do you talk about that? Do you? Is it something? Because you mentioned you want students to arrive at those conclusions on their own. Do you bring in current things? In um, yeah, I do. Um, so, f for example, you know, talking about um, the Vietnam War ten years ago, um, at the time it made a lot of sense to compare it with the Iraq War, and just this notion, you know, when I, when I talk about the Tonkin Gulf Resolution ten years ago, there would be this immediate um, uh, connection that could be made between the manner in which J Johnson got. Congress to pass the Tonkin Gulf Resolution and the manner in which the Bush administration got Congress to authorize the, um, uh, the use of force against Iraq, you know, the, the doctored uh, intelligence and all that kind of stuff. So, so it, it, I guess it depends on the moment that you're in. There are, uh, um, you know, back in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, when there was, and in fact, I guess this would be the, be the countdown to the Iraq war because the, uh, the Bush administration was very upset with the French for not uh, getting on board with this uh, uh, drive for war. And um, in the House of Representatives banned um, the sale, uh, they, they changed um, the name of French fries to Freedom Fries. Oh, yeah. Okay, and so that was great for discussions of World War I. Because you know, during in World War I, against the backdrop of anti-German sentiment, that's you know, uh, frankfurters get changed to Liberty sausage and or to hot dogs, and uh, sauerkraut gets sauerkraut gets changed to Liberty cabbage and and, and so forth. So it, it, you you get the you can catch these waves where there are current events that. Um, resonate with historical events, but of course the moment passes and you get this new crop of, uh, of students who have no memory of it. So I, I can't make all those jokes about freedom fries anymore, um, except to graduate students. Um, one other question, what, um, what type of assignment, so like we saw kind of your, like a mini lecture, what kind of assignments do you do in your classes that engage students and how do those relate to your lectures uh, to, to arrive at the kind of substantive mm -hmm. and psychological? Um, well, um, I have in the past, I mean, my, I guess my, my use of assignments uh, is not gonna be as, uh, as sexy and as innovative as I would like it to sound, but um, basically having them write papers uh, explaining why the United States, uh, with the, Lon the Jin Johnson administration, escalated the war in Vietnam, um, having them maybe write papers about the, um, more generally, um, in, in say classes on U.S. history, papers on the um, growth of anti-government sentiment among ordinary citizens, you know, in the 60s and 70s. And this is something that certainly occurs on the left where people are upset about Vietnam and then later Watergate, but then, but it's also taking place on the right. 
um, where th there's this critique that the national government is being too uh, supportive of civil rights. It's, it's going too far to try to remedy past uh, discrimination. Um, so that, those would be ways in which I try, I uh, um, give out assignments that pick up on those themes. But the, the um, you, for the most part, Vietnam plays a pretty small role in any class I teach. And so it's rare that I'll have a whole paper or assignment that's uh, geared towards Vietnam itself. Any other questions or comments? Okay, okay, sure. Um, you mentioned that you have that, that trigger warning at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, how do you deal with students who do have, um, if they have emotion, like if, if they find the content difficult? And is that something that well, you- Well, I, um, I haven't had anyone um, approach me individually about that. Um, I'm trying, to th I'm trying to think back to any instances where that, that occurred. Um, yeah, I've, I mean, I think maybe it's because in, in the kinds of courses I teach, uh, you know, maybe in, in history there's a bit um, more uh, kind of prior exposure to a lot of this ugly stuff. Um, and so there's, there's less sensitivity. I, I don't know, I, I have not personally had um, anyone um, approach me on this and, re and re require any f further accommodations beyond the the, more, the blanket trigger warning. Yeah. So I have a question about the student's subjective experience as you walked the students, the class through the historical accidents. How, uh, what kind of elements would you use to uh, help the students to experience that moment in history subjectively and to have um, like perspectives from both sides of a conflict? Um, I mean, I guess basically what I, the way I try to achieve that is doing what I showed here but at greater length and in greater depth. So there were um, you know, the gentleman earlier you know, mentioned that you know, what part of the missing context was the, um, the horrific nature of the Vietnam War itself. So it's most of my longer lectures on Vietnam do contain um, more description and some, in some cases um, more video footage showing the, you know, what the Vietnam War what really was like. Um, and so that, I mean, that's part of it because it, 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 it contributes to the sense of urgency that those who were uh, trying to end the war experienced. Uh, also, to some extent, although I, I don't do this uh, enough, it, it gives some sense of what the people in Vietnam itself were experiencing. Um, and I, and I, as I said earlier, I have longer, uh, there's a longer um, discussion that I engage in on Lyndon Johnson's point of view. Because, I mean, he really, I mean, he, he did some really horrific stuff, but he's also a pretty poignant, tragic figure. Uh, when you think about what he really, you know, would have preferred to do and what he ended up doing instead. Um, and so I, I do go in, at, into that subject at greater length, show more video, uh, read passages from his uh, memoirs, which are, strikingly revealing about, you know, they really, uh, it's almost, I mean, you almost want to say, TMI, TMI. Um, but, um, so th those are ways that I try to uh, get students to really experience the, these events on a more visceral level, and in that way, you know, hopefully, understand the, uh, the actions that people took uh, from various perspectives that may, to our eyes, seem kind of extreme. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thanks everybody for staying, and if you could help me give a warm thank you to Salim for sharing thank this. You. Thank you.